12. It is uh, 12 out here in Southern California. As you can see, I dress differently in California versus how Charlie, Rabbi Charlie, and you'll see the other, uh, our speaker and um, one of our guests that uses dresses on the East Coast and the West Coast is very relaxed. Um, that, and I ran out the house without putting on my collared shirt, but I'll, I'll go with this. You know, I can go for a hike after this program. So it is Sunday, it's June 13th. If you're keeping track of days and times, it is 12 p.m. in California, 3 p.m. on the East Coast. Very impressed. I did not get 100 emails at 9 a.m. this morning from East Coast people asking me why the Zoom wasn't working. Usually I have to email people and tell them, well, it's really um, 12 out here in California. So you guys did great. For those of you who have never heard of CSP, this is our 21st year of offering programs. For our first 19 years, we were a very, you know, Orange County, California-based organization with live programs out here. But uh, because of COVID, we went online um, about uh, in March 2020. And since then, uh, we've done 254 programs online. So this is program number 255. So the pivot has been great for us. We now have participants from 38 states, 12 countries. And um, so I welcome you all from around the United States and some of you from around the world. Many of our, if you've missed our programs, many of our recent programs are up on YouTube. So you can go to the OCCSP YouTube channel and check out some amazing programs. If you want to learn more about CSP, go to OCCSP.net. I will put it in the chat as well. Join our email list. We'd love to have you with us. Some uh, programs I wanted to mention. This is, we've just, this is, uh, we do our fundraising in June, July, and August of every year. So this is our big uh, fundraising time. All the money that we get goes to programs um, like today's program with Rabbi Chalushkin. So please do support CSP if you have already. Much appreciated. We have lots coming up this summer, including programs with Erica Brown, Shirel Horovitz, Toby Khan, Bert Vazadsky, Daniel Matt, Rachel Kolsky, and Rafi Zaram. Very happy to also introduce the uh, Topal Virtual Travel Tuesday series that Rabbi Savinar has helped us put together. We're going to Riga in July, and hopefully you'll join us for many adventures with CSP. The program today is um, entitled The Power of Moral Imagination, which is a working title for Rabbi Chalishkin's newest book. And our guest um, speaker is Rabbi Joseph Chalishkin, live from New York. But before we uh, jump to the program, I wanted to uh, take a little time. Uh, we recognize someone before every program, an honor. Um, and today we are very happy to honor Rabbi Charlie Savinor. Uh, in, uh, in trying to figure out how to celebrate our 21st year, we came up with, a, with an idea. And the idea was to celebrate the educators because we succeed based on having amazing teachers and presenters. And in that regard, we, we are celebrating our 21st year with the creation of CSP's Maimonides Award for Excellence in Jewish Education. And um, we're very happy to present the inaugural award to my good friend, Rabbi Charlie Savinor. Uh, he's the Director of Congregational Education at Park Avenue Synagogue in New York City, a widely respected authority on Jewish leadership and education. Rabbi Savinor is a great educator in his own right, and particularly during the pandemic, he's been a great resource for CSP and other Jewish organizations seeking content and direction. Rabbi Savinor was ordained um, at the Jewish Theological Seminary in 1996 and earned his Master's in Education at Columbia University. Over the course of his decades-long career, He's been at the forefront of innovative approaches to leadership uh, development and educational initiatives, including travel education. Under Rabbi Savinar's leadership at Park Avenue Synagogue, travel education became another portal of entry for the synagogue uh, and connected members of the members to the um, importance of Jewish peoplehood spanning the globe. In 2018, he directed Park Avenue's congregational trip to Israel, which has set the record for the largest single synagogue trip in Israel's history. Given the historic nature of what has happened in Israel today, I anticipate that Park Avenue and other synagogues are going to try to break that record and take more people. But it was like uh, 500 people. I don't know the exact number that, that was in this amazing program. So um, when we were thinking about who best to give the inaugural award to, um, really, it, it, was, it was relatively easy to select uh, my good friend, Rabbi Charlie Savinor. And um, I wanted to invite... Rabbi Neil Zuckerman, um, who is a rabbi at Park Avenue Synagogue, to say just a few words about Rabbi Charlie. Then we give Charlie just a brief few minutes, if it's possible, to say a few words. Then we'll jump into our program with Rabbi Talishkin. I'll mute myself, uh, Rabbi Zuckerman. Um, I give you the stage. Ari, thank you. 
Uh, Rabbi Savner, Charlie has spoken about you for years and the program you run, and it's such a pleasure to meet you. Uh, we were at about 500 on that uh, congregational trip, uh, and uh, I, I, I hope one day it gets broken like any record, and I hope it doesn't, right? Um, among uh, Rabbi Savner's many, many great qualities that you um, that you uh, recounted in your introduction. Before I say what I want to say, I want to I want to tell you that you will not meet a a bigger mensch, a greater lover of the Jewish people and Judaism in the state of Israel than Rabbi Savinar, and that comes out in every single thing that he does. It is an absolute pleasure to to be here and to honor my uh, former roommate in rabbinical school and good friend. Uh, with this inaugural Maimonides Award. Uh, Rabbi Savinar, um, earlier in the book of Bamidbar, uh, the Torah tells us that these are the descendants of Moshe and Aharon on the day that the Lord spoke to Moses at Sinai. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the text goes on to say. Rashi comes along and points out a problem in the verse that the sons named were not in fact the descendants of Moses and Aaron, but only of Aaron, the high priest. And uh, Rashi goes on to make the point, uh, which uh, is an important point for you, uh, for us, but specifically for, for your honor today. But Rashi says, only the sons of Aaron were mentioned. They are called descendants of Moshe because he taught them Torah. This shows that whoever teaches another person's child Torah, it's just as if they were your own child. Um, Rabbi Savinar, uh, when, we, uh, when we share our own Torah, uh, the deepest Torah of our lives, uh, we give birth to something real and important in the world. I've heard you speak about your teachers, your mentors, uh, the way that you developed. I've watched you over the years teach Torah by the way that you live, not just by sharing knowledge, but by modeling, as I said, a, a love of Torah, a, a, a love of the Jewish people, a love of Am Yisrael and Eretz Yisrael. I've watched you with members of our community. Uh, I've stood side by side with you uh, in, uh, in Melton, uh, in the number of times that we have traveled together around the world and brought a diversity of Torah to our community uh, with anyone whose life you have touched. And there have been many, many people in your years at Park Avenue Synagogue and even before. You've helped so many of them to believe in the possibility of the journey that we talk about and to take steps on embarking on that journey. I, I don't know, Ari, whether you always have this many people on your programs or whether these are all just uh, the fans of Rabbi Savinor, but so many people on this Zoom, Charlie, look to you as their friend, as their inspiration, and as their gateway into a more substantive and more meaningful Jewish life and Jewish identity. Years, decades from now, I suspect your presence will still be with them as they talk to their friends and their teachers and their children and their students about who it was who drew them in who it was who believed in them, and who it was who set a standard for them to which they wanted to aspire. Rabbi, we know that they'll never be able to repay you for this, but you already know after years in this business, in this sacred calling, that repayment is not what it's about, and that the true reward comes from other sources, sources that both live above and within. This, uh, this Maimonides Award is, uh, is just a small token of, uh, of affection and gratitude that so many of us feel for you and the journey that you've allowed us to take. Uh, as I said, both as your former roommate at JTS back at 121st Street, I think, um, through the years that we have toiled in the vineyards of the Lord, Charlie, um, I am so proud to say these words to you before you receive a well-deserved reward for all that you have done on behalf of 
the Jewish people, on behalf of Park Avenue Synagogue, and everyone's life who you have touched on this Zoom. I want to wish you a Mazal Tov, and uh, I can't wait to give you a hug. Thank you, Rabbi Zuckerman. Uh, okay, Charlie, I'm giving you a moment, and then we got to get started, okay? You promise? I'm on the clock. Thank you, Ari. Um, by the way, my thanking you right then is, doesn't go against my time. I just want to be clear. Um, but I do want to begin by thanking um, a few folks, and then I have a short message that I'd like to share. First of all, to you, Rabbi Zuckerman, thank you so much. And um, I know today there's a mazel tov to you uh, for Lily's high school graduation. So I just want to let you know, I really appreciate you being here. And um, your words today mean more to me than you'll ever know. Um, Ari Katz, um, you are a visionary, you're a dear friend, and uh, we uh, who are Jewish educational professionals, Jewish professionals, are in awe of what you do every day just as a hobby. Um, special thanks to Amy as well and your homegrown group of superheroes. Um, to my parents, um, I'll say about more about them in a moment, um, to my brothers, um, we just, uh, I'm really blessed to have all of you in my life, to my colleagues at Park Avenue Synagogue, um, in the community of Park Avenue Synagogue. Um, I appreciate, uh, um, so many of you being here today, but also, um, your presence in my life and that of my family, um, to my teachers who helped me reach this moment. Um, and I really feel like anyone I learn with is a teacher as well to my sons, Joseph and Benji. Um, for learning with me over the past uh, years, but especially the past year, and being my teachers about resilience and hope, especially during COVID. Um, to my wife, Julie, um, you are the rock of our family. Um, and until I met you, I, I had only dreamed of what true love, support, and partnership can be. And I, um, I, I'd never be able to thank you enough. Um, and in terms of my final thank yous, I'd like to thank the Almighty. I'd like to thank God for um, enabling uh, me to reach this day. Um, every time I contemplated what I wanted to say, my thoughts brought me back to my parents' home. Both my mother and my father uh, were trained as educators and saw the world that way. My mother has a background in special ed, and my, my father's areas of specialty were history and Judaism. 26 years after my father's passing, I can still picture him at the end of a long day of work, sitting in his chair with a book in his hand, two newspapers by his side, while listening to Nightline on front of the TV in front of him. I deeply appreciate the sacrifices that my parents made so that my brothers and I could have meaningful Jewish experiences as we grew up. Two years ago, my mom and Paul, um, who by the way is also an educator and we love you, Paul, um, moved out of the home where we uh, and my brothers were raised after 45 years. And on a home, uh, on a visit to uh, my mom and Paul, I had four hours to go through my room. Um, how do you decide what to keep and what to discard. I came up with the system on the spot that I called heirlooms and souvenirs. Souvenirs are mementos of experiences we once had, t-shirts, flyers, trinkets, meant to remind us of an experience. Heirlooms are what we must take with us forever because we know that we must pass them down to the next generation. That day, I took my father's books with his bookmarks still in place, photos of my family from Lithuania, from Russia, and letters that my mother wrote in 1979 when she and my father visited Egypt and Israel. The most important heirloom, <clears throat> though, was something invisible, an enduring passion for Judaism, Jewish learning, and Jewish life. I'm humbled to be singled out for excellence in Jewish education in the midst of so many incredible Jewish educators. In particular, our keynote speaker today literally wrote the book 
on engaging and enduring Jewish content. Um, in my eyes, excellent Jewish education is lifelong education. It's the nexus of content, creativity, community that brings real meaning to our lives, adds meaning to our lives. I'd like to say it's not about the spaces, it's about the faces. And that's actually um, more true than ever during the past year. For me, Jewish education is a tool to form relationships of meaning grounded in something that leaks, links us together in the moment and as well as to our past and to our future. This CSP ward means so much to me because I know the impact CSP is having. Finally, I wanna close with the story that I heard about Elie Wiesel. He once said, he was once asked, excuse me, if your house was on fire, what would you take with you? This question is not so different from my experience of standing in my childhood room to figure out what do I take with me? And what do I discard? Wiesel responded, I would take the fire. To him, the fire represents passion, creativity, and courage in the face of challenge and change. In receiving this honor from CSP, I realized that there's one other thing I took from my parents' home, namely my father's fire. His passion, compassion, commitment to family and community, and his resilience in the face of change, big and small. I must admit, sometimes when I teach, I feel too thick. I feel my father's presence on my shoulder, and I feel that my soul is on fire. It is humbling to be recognized for not just what I do, but how I do it. CSP and the work that Ari Katz does should give us great hope that together we can set the world on fire with learning and pass that flame to the next generation. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Rabbi Charlie. Um, so to recognize um, this day, we, we sent uh, Rabbi Charlie a, a present to his house. It's a gicle print from artist Isaac Bringegaard Bialik entitled Ahavat Olam. Uh, the words of this prayer, thank God for all the gift uh, of Torah. So we thought that would be an appropriate gift. It's, um, if you don't know the artist, he's taken old comic books and he, he takes pieces of them to build into his art. Since Charlie loves comic books and loves Torah, we thought it would be a great gift. So that arrived. We have a video of it that we'll share later, not during this program, if you want to see what it looks like. Uh, but as a surprise, I wanted um, Charlie to know and all of you to know that we're setting up a uh, special endowment uh, in memory of Charlie's father, um, Joseph Savinor. Um, and we already have a $5,000 matching grant. So if anybody wants to contribute, um, we'd love your help in creating this endowment. And every year there'll be a, a program through CSP in memory of um, Charlie's father, Zichron um, Libracha. So thank you and thank you uh, everybody for joining us today. We're gonna go into our program right now. Uh, as I mentioned, we had people who've arrived a little late um, and uh, we're very happy to have Rabbi Joseph Telushkin live from New York City. Uh, our topic for today is The Power of Moral Imagination, which is the working title of Rabbi Telushkin's uh, newest book. Uh, Rabbi Telushkin is a spiritual leader. He's well known, a well-known scholar of Jewish history and ethics and a prolific author. His large body of work includes more than 15 books of nonfiction, a mystery series and television and movie scripts. His book, Jewish Literacy, that Charlie just showed you, the most important things to know about the Jewish religion, its people and history, is the most widely read book on, on Judaism of the past two decades. The biography that I have and that I shared with you goes on for pages. Rabbi Telushkin says, die enough, not in a bad way, like, you know, die enough. Um, he wants to speak. So I'm going to mute myself. I want to thank you all for being here. And again, um, thank you, uh, Rabbi Savino, for everything you've done for Jewish education and for CSP. You've been a great resource um, for CSP over the years. Uh, now it's time to learn in your honor. And I'm going to mute myself. Rabbi Telushkin, I'll unmute you and uh, everybody. I'm very honored. First of all, can I be heard clearly? Great. Okay, I'm very honored 
to be participating in this event. Ari, I am aware of the very important breakthroughs and the work that you've done. And Rabbi Savinor, Rabbi Zuckerman, I'm honored to share share this, uh, I was going to say share this stage, share this platform with all of you, because you both have done so much. The book I am working on now called The Power of Moral Imagination, what in a sense has inspired me to write it is, is in the last century, more than a century, there have been extraordinary advances in medicine, science, and technology. And the final analysis, those advances have come about because an individual or a group of people use the full resources of their intellectual imagination to answer questions that had been thought to be unanswerable or to address problems that had been thought to be unsolvable. There have not been comparable advances in morality. I don't want to deny that there have been. There have been some real advances if a person, the status of women, certainly in much of the Western world has improved dramatically. Uh, the status of people who are mentally challenged and the concern about them has improved dramatically. On the other hand, we're well aware that the 20th century, specifically because of modern inventions and other things, had more bloodshed than any other century. One of the things I want to address is also to make the study of ethics and morality exciting. It's not sufficiently exciting. I'll give an example of what I mean. I would like to see parents reserve the highest praise of their children for when their children do kind acts. As a general rule in our society, in the broad American society and in the Jewish society, Children get their highest compliments for one of four things. Their intellectual achievements, their intellectual academic achievements, their sports abilities, their cultural abilities, singing, dancing. And in the case of girls, but not only girls, in the case of boys and girls, but even more so girls, for their looks. A child who gets his or her greatest compliments about that. And believe me, children need compliments. We all do. We all need to have our egos fairly satisfied. But when you hear a parent say, <clears throat> oh, but so-and-so is a good kid, it almost sounds like they feel they have nothing to brag about. You look at one of the great works of Jewel, Mor Jewish moral literature, the Mesilas Yesharim, uh, The Path of the Upright. And the writer writes in the introduction, People often think that when people speak a lot about ethical behavior, they're a little on the simple side. You know, respect for their intellect derives from it being much more complicated. But given the world's need for morality, I wanted to also demonstrate, I want to demonstrate, because I'm in the midst of writing the book, that coming to conclusions about ethics also involves a dynamism, an intellectual capacity, an intellectual creativeness. I'll just give you a couple of examples of what I mean. And in fact, the speech will consist quite a bit of anecdotes reflecting that because I want to encourage everybody, and myself included, to think in terms of what's the moral solution and how do you achieve it? Okay, here's an example that comes to mind and it's not a well-known story. I was thinking of what you were saying, Charlie, about how your father loved history. And that's also was my passion. I, I did my graduate work in Columbia. I passed my orals. I ended up not writing my dissertation. I started doing popular writing and it's hard to go back to academic. But I had that image. You gave a very nice image in, uh, that you presented of your father sitting there, which, which what I always do, surrounded by newspapers, listening to something that's going on and reading books. And so here's a story about Teddy Roosevelt, not a well-known story. Roosevelt, prior to being president of the United States, was in 1895-96, the police commissioner of New York City. And an event happened. The Jewish community already was fairly substantial in New York in the late 1800s, but not nearly the size of what it became. 
and there were Germans uh, who people who had emigrated from Germany to the United States, and they were bringing over a speaker from Germany who was a known anti-Semite. So now a man would go around in Germany and give anti-Semitic speeches, and he was now coming to the United States, to New York. And some of the leading Jews in the city went to the police commissioner, Teddy Roosevelt, and they said to him, why don't you put a ban on letting this guy speak? He's just here to cause trouble. He's here to cause hatred of Jews. He should be banned. And certainly we're requesting, don't give him police protection. Roosevelt said to them, I understand why you're asking for that, but number one, I think it's illegal. I can't just put a ban on the guy speaking. And as regards your request, I don't give him police protection. That's probably also forbidden, but I actually don't think it's within your interests. Because if we don't let him speak and we don't provide him with police protection, he will become a martyr. That's how people will see him. Subject of persecution by who? By the Jews. He says, our goal should be to make him ridiculous. And so what Roosevelt did was he assigned 40 policemen to be present every time this guy spoke. All 40 of them were Jews. He assigned 40 Jewish cops and a Jewish sergeant to head the detail to do it. This is what I, this is what I call an example of moral imagination. It's an imaginative solution that achieves its effect in, a, in an indirect way, but the effect becomes all the more powerful. I'll give you another example that I came across. I tend in my books to be very, very fastidious in always citing my sources. I don't like to use material that I can't verify in footnote. This one, however, is based on something I read quite a number of years ago, and I unfortunately, when I read it, didn't write down the source. But it's an example of how to offer criticism in a manner that can actually bring about change. Because the goal when we offer criticism is to try and change the person's behavior. And we know it probably usually doesn't have that effect. Anyway, a medical professor at a medical college was making the point to his students that no matter how dire a, a patient's situation is, you should never deprive a person of all hope. Seems commonsensical. I think most of us, you know, follow his reasoning. One student though, wasn't impressed. He raised his hand and he said, look, professor, we're men of science here. We're people of science here. We're not clergy. We're not handholders. If a situation is hopeless, we should convey that to the person. The professor said, I think that attitude disqualifies you from being a, a good doctor. And he said to the student, I feel that so strongly that I want you to leave this class. I want you to go downstairs to the office of the dean and said that I don't think you should be in a medical school. The story is going to have a surprising punchline. The student, needless to say, was like sitting in a seat frozen. He obviously never thought that he would prompt such a reaction, and he just was frozen in his seat. About a minute later, the professor said, no, I'm serious. I want you to leave the room. I don't want you in this class. I don't think you should be in this medical school. Go down and tell the dean uh, that I think you should be expelled. The student at that point had no choice. He knew he had to leave the class. So he gets up. He walks slowly towards the door. When he gets to the door and opens it, the professor says, you can sit back down now. He said, I just wanted you to experience for two minutes what it's like to be deprived of all hope. What a powerful way to convey to somebody that you don't deprive people of all hope. I'm sure that student remembered that for the rest of his life. Hopefully he incorporated it as a lesson, but I'm sure also the other students who witnessed what happened, it made an impression on them. Again, these are all aspects of what I call moral imagination. Moral imagination is therefore when you use your intellect, again, to solve a problem that might not easily seem solvable. Probably the first example I can think of, and given that I'm on a panel here, 
with two very, very distinguished rabbis. If other examples occur to you from the Bible, please tell me. The first one that occurs to me in the Bible is, of course, the story for which Solomon became famous. Two women come to him. Both of them have given birth. The Bible identifies that they, in fact, both were prostitutes, so not surprisingly, uh, there, there's no fathers with them. And they live together. And one night, I'll just review the story quickly. I suspect most of the people here have heard this story. Uh, one night, one of them accidentally crushes her child. The child dies. And the woman who crushed the child, we don't know which of the two it was. I can only call them A and B. Uh, the woman who crushed the child substitutes, puts the other mother's deep asleep. She takes the dead child, puts it in the mother's arms, and she takes the other. Anyway, both claim to be uh, the mother of the child. Solomon was really in a, in a great dilemma because there was no DNA evidence in those days. How does he decide what to do? So he, he says to the two mothers, he said, this is the only possible solution. We're gonna take a sword, we're gonna cut the child in half and you'll each get half. And one of the women says, that's okay with her. The other woman says, don't do that. Give her the child, uh, you'll kill the child. And Solomon obviously realizes that the woman who had the compassion, that's the one whose child it is. So again, this was a moral imagination at a time when it was much harder to figure out the answer to, the, to such a question. Look at the other examples of moral imagination. I remember I was born in 1948, so I'm 72 now. And I remember when I was growing up, uh, Jews by and large uh, were Democrats. And believe me, I'm not gonna start getting into a political discussion here. Uh, one needs a lot more moral imagination than I have to try and resolve the unfortunate enmities that are going on now. But I remember, you know, in the neighborhood in which I grew up, most people I knew favored Adlai Stevenson over, uh, over General Eisenhower. And I have no issue or argument with people about that. But for some reason, prevalent in the neighborhoods and in the Jewish community was a feeling that Eisenhower wasn't that bright. And over the years, I've read a number of things about me that have caused me to alter that impression. But I'll tell you one of them. When the Allies liberated the first concentration camp that they liberated, or one of the first, Eisenhower was there. And Eisenhower insisted on personally being given a very comprehensive inspection of the concentration camp. In a letter he wrote to Marshall, who was the Secretary of Defense, he said Patton wouldn't even accompany him into the camp because he said he wouldn't have the stomach for it. And Eisenhower explained, this was, I think it was in April of 45, Eisenhower explained why he wanted to have a comprehensive examination of the camp. He said, I want to be in a position, should there ever arise a tendency in the future to say that this was wartime propaganda and that such Nazi atrocities had not been committed, I want to be in a position to be able to have it noted that Dwight Eisenhower, the head of the U.S. Army, can personally testify that he had seen the uh, what was done, what the effects of these atrocities were. How many people were thinking in 1945 that there would arise a movement to deny it? Now compare someone like Eisenhower, whose intellect has sometimes been challenged with a man who is one of the most widely known academics. And apparently in a study I saw one of the 10 most widely cited academics, a man named Noam Chomsky. Now Noam Chomsky is what I would call, maybe I'm being unfair, a non-Jewish Jew. When I use that term, what I mean by it is there are basically three ways you usually affirm your Jewishness. One is through your belief in, in the Jewish God, the God of the Torah. And I always say Judaism's contribution to the world, in my view, was not monotheism. It was ethical monotheism. It was the idea that there's one God whose primary demand of human beings is ethical behavior. He has other demands, but that's the primary one. Then there is also the notion of Torah, uh, the binding uh, laws of the Jews. 
And then, of course, there's the notion of Jewish peoplehood, an aspect of Judaism that a lot of non-Jews have never, don't really understand, but it goes back to the very earliest roots of Judaism, when Ruth converts to Judaism and assumes a Jewish identity, she says four words in Hebrew, your people shall be my people, your God shall be my God. In other words, the two are fused, are really fused together. So Chomsky, I don't think has proven himself to be a very loyal adherent to Jewish peoplehood. And certainly I don't assume based on his writings that he feels bound by the Torah or by the God of Israel. What he does feel bound to do is he wrote a preface to a book by a French professor denying, Fortesan, denying that the Holocaust happened. And he has repeatedly said a person can deny that the Holocaust happened without being an anti-Semite. So I compare someone like him who's regarded as a major intellect with somebody like Eisenhower whose intellectual strengths have not been so highly regarded. And I said, are we missing something? We are. When there is no moral imagination, there is a terrible decline in morality. There is a terrible decline in goodness. And it's very, very impressive. Moral imagination runs through, in fact, Jewish sources, often in, in ways that can be a little surprising. For example, there's a statement in the Talmud that a parent should never promise to give a child something and then not follow through. So often when I'm speaking to a group, let's say I'm teaching a class with 30 people present, I'll usually, uh, I'll ask people, okay, finish the statement. What do you think the Talmud's reasoning is? A parent should never promise to give a child something and then not follow through. What's the reasoning? And people usually say, with some great justification, because it'll hurt the child's feelings very much. And, uh, you know, and to be, so to speak, deceived by your parents is a terrible feeling, all of which are very valid points. But there's something else. How does the Talmud actually conclude uh, that teaching? It said, because through that behavior, a child will learn that it's okay to lie. It's very fascinating. We are role models for our children. And if these role models, and certainly when children are small, they see their parents, usually, I mean, if they're pretty good parents, they see their parents as their models to learn how to behave. And if a, if a parent can promise to do something and then not follow through, it means the child is the same. So again, it's the moral imagination. I remember years ago, uh, our children were, were best friends, you know, with, with children who lived in the same apartment building with us. And I, and I promised them that I was gonna take them all out for ice cream. And, uh, and then the day sort of got away from us and it got a little too late. And the mother of uh, the upstairs children, uh, who was also a religiously committed Jew, and, you know, she said, you know what, it got too late, we can't do it. I said, and then I quoted her this Talmud, I said, I don't care, we got to do it. I don't ever want to promise my children something and then not follow through. Obviously, we can all envision terrible emergencies, you know, but other than that, and, you know, and she went along with it. But again, it's the moral imagination. What's the implication of what you're doing? I'll give you another case that I heard of. The woman who called me up to tell me of it is a woman named Sarah Horowitz. There are two Sarah Horowitzes that I know of in Jewish life. One was the first woman who was ordained as an Orthodox rabbi by Rabbi Avi Weiss. And another Sarah Horowitz, and the story is going to turn out to be about her, is a woman who I became friendly with relatively uh, recently. Uh, she was actually, for eight years, she was the uh, chief speechwriter uh, in the Obama administration for, oh God, I'm losing my mind. Ah, what's the president's wife's first name? Michelle. She was the chief speechwriter for Michelle Obama. Uh, and then Michelle Obama actually wanted her to work with her on her memoir, which was a fantastically successful book. But Sarah Horowitz, who in recent years had become much more Jewishly involved, wanted to write a book on the future of American Jewish life Anyway, so she called me up and told me of an incident that she had heard during this COVID epidemic. One of the 
among the many terrible things that happened as a result of COVID was that people were having very close relatives die and there couldn't be a decent sized funeral. You know, in the early months, nobody was allowed basically, or they'd allow one person or two people, you know, almost nothing. And obviously anybody who's ever attended a Jewish funeral and then followed by a burial knows that one of the very moving aspects of the burial service is that when it's concluded, all those who are visiting break into lines of two and the mourners walk between them and the mourners call out words of consolation. You know, there are standard words of consolation and then, you know, spontaneous things that people say. And of course, for those who died during the COVID epidemic, they didn't have that opportunity. And uh, Sarah Horowitz called me up. She said she heard of the case. I haven't tracked it down. I have to find where it happened. But at one synagogue, a large synagogue, there had been a death and people really did want to comfort the mourners in the traditional way. So what they did was they went to a very large and empty parking lot. It could have been the synagogue parking lot or another. And they came about 30 carloads of people came and they broke into line into two lines with the cars, you know, like 30 feet apart from each other facing in the same direction. And as the mourners drove through, people called out from their car the words of consolation. I use that principle to make a point, even when you think nothing can be done, almost always you will find something can be done. If you really want to do something, if you want to take some action, you will find that if you think hard enough, something can still be done. That's why that struck me as such a, you know, a beautiful example of moral imagination. And then of course you have it happening on a more macro level. I remember there was a case that happened in the early 1990s in, uh, in Billings, Montana, where there had been white supremacists and obviously, you know, there were not a large number of such people but when you're dealing with evil, one of the unfair things in life is that it doesn't take an enormous number of evil people to cause tremendous pain. It's not like as if the world would consisted of half good people and half bad people. All we would then need is a few more good people to make the world good. No, it's not that. The good people, or at least the people who refrain from doing evil, have to greatly, greatly outnumber the bad people. You know, just think about it. Uh, bad people uh, commit a crime, a mass murder, and, and lives are, are just, of many, many people are destroyed. Anyway, so in Billings, Montana, there was a, a Jewish household. I think the whole city at the time had only about a few dozen Jews, Jewish families. And a young Jewish boy, a five-year-old boy, had, had his Hanukkah menorah, uh, you know, poised near his window. And an anti-Semite, you know, threw a rock through the window. It shattered it. And uh, the parents, when they went to the police, the police, you know, acted sympathetically, but basically suggested, well, maybe you shouldn't do that. But a Christian woman heard about it and she thought, what would I feel like? What would my child feel like if a rock was thrown through our window because we had a Christmas tree? And she went to her pastor and urged her pastor to get involved. And then the Billings, Montana, the main newspaper in town actually printed on like the back page of the first section, a giant cutout menorah. And over a thousand people put the menorah in their window. Once again, that's a sense of moral imagination. J.K. Rowling, the writer of the Harry Potter series very disturbed by what had happened uh, with uh, when Jeremy Corbyn was the head of the Labour Party in England. You know, and he, he made a statement how he regarded leaders of Hamas as his friends. Uh, he planted flowers uh, at the graves of people who had carried out terrorist acts against Israel. He later on, of course, claimed he didn't realize that they had done it, but yeah. I was very convinced. 
And uh, so J.K. Rowling started coming out, calling anti-Zionism anti-Semitism. She said, there's something wrong. There's something wrong if we expect that Jews on their own have to fight anti-Semitism alone. We are not free because we're non-Jews. It's not sufficient for us to say, I'm not going to act like an anti-Semite. You have to participate in fighting against it. Again, there's the moral imagination that you don't want to leave people in such a place of feeling of feeling so alone. What I want to do in the book is I go back and forth between examples that could be very personal, very micro, and then, of course, examples that are macro. Here, I'll give you now an example, though, that's micro. I consider the Billings, Montana one and the behavior of J.K. Rowling to be more on a macro level. But here's a micro one. I had a friend, a very close friend, who in his early 60s got a very severe form uh, of cancer and a very ho hopeless one. It was, it was advancing very, very quickly. From the time he was diagnosed, he knew that in all likelihood he had less than a month to live. And that really was the case. I actually think his wife would not mind if I named her, but since I, I, I and, and in my book, I do plan, uh, but since I didn't speak about, it, speak about it with her before today's lecture, I'm not gonna mention his name. They had six children. He knew he probably was, in all likelihood, he was probably not gonna be living for more than another few weeks. So he did what most people would do in a case like that. He summoned his children. He wanted to see all of them before he died. But he also said something very interesting to them. He said, your mother is still a young woman. She was in her late 50s. And he said, I want you to know we've had an extraordinary marriage. And it's true. They really did. And I think everybody knew it. I want you to understand. I want your mother to have another chance to find love in her life. So if your mother finds somebody who she thinks is, wor is worthy, I want you to know this would make me happy. Now, anybody who's a rabbi knows that there often is a tension uh, when a man or a woman dies and the spouse remarries. Very often, uh, one or more of the remaining you know, living children resent the parent for marrying again, resent the new wife, he relieved them of that resentment. I was always very impressed with that story. And I, there was somebody I was genuinely close with because in those last weeks of his life, he always thought in those terms. In the last weeks of his life, I was speaking to him every day. But when my son was having a bar mitzvah, he said, I know you're having a bar mitzvah in your family. Don't call me for the next four days. And this was a very, very considerate man. Now I want to contrast it, though, with an interesting story about a great American figure that a lot of us know a certain detail about this person, but a lot of us don't know the full backstory. Thomas Jefferson. Obviously, we all know that Jefferson was the author of the Declaration of Independence. We're all aware of the fact that he probably was the one who created the expression, all men are created equal. And we're also aware of the peculiarity of the fact that a man who could write that had slaves. And in recent years, what I think very many of us are familiar with is the fact that he had a very long-term relationship with one of those slaves, a woman named Sally Hemings. Uh, it started when she was very young, either 14 or 16, and Jefferson had... Uh, if I'm not mistaken, had six children. I don't know if they all survived. But in any case, we know about that. So what's the part of the backstory people don't know? Jefferson had been in very deep love with his wife, Martha Jefferson. She died at a very young age. I think she was 34 when she died. He was 39. They had also had like six children together. Uh, and in, the, in those days, we know a lot of children didn't survive past their earlier years. And that was the case with her. Her sixth pregnancy was a very difficult, life-threatening one. And it soon became apparent that she was probably going to die. And she made her husband promise her that he would never take another wife. 
Jefferson at that time was 39. To ask a 39 year old man to, con con to confine himself and never take another wife might have had something to do with his starting the relationship with Sally Hemings, which I'm not out here to justify. Uh, I mean, the other peculiarity in the slave situation was slave owners often slept with their slaves. And Sally Hemings, it so happens, was actually the half sister of Jefferson's wife. So there was probably some political resemblances and other things, uh, some physical resemblances. But the point I'm making is, look at the difference between what she did and look what my friend did. You know, obviously Jefferson considered himself to be a man of his word. He didn't have a choice. He had to undertake the oath that his wife, uh, his dying wife, you know, was inflicting on him. So again, this is moral imagination. Moral imagination during the final days of one's life. Israel Salanter, who is considered to be the one of the great Jewish ethicists in all of Jewish history, he died quite suddenly. He was traveling. The Jewish community had assigned somebody to sort of accompany him. He was in his 70s. And, you know, when he died in the mid 1880s, that was considered a, a man of, you know, of good years. That was not such an early age to die at in your uh, early 70s. And he died fairly suddenly. Uh, there was not time to summon a doctor in the last few hours of his life. So the next day, you know, he was dead. They asked the showmare, the man who had been with him. They wanted to know, did Salanter have any great last words? Salanter spent the last hour of his life speaking to this man that acknowledging that many people are superstitious about death. Many people are squeamish about being alone with a dead body. He spent the last hour of his life assuring this man that that was foolish, that there's no reason to feel uncomfortable with being alone with a dead body. I mean, can you think of a more powerful example of moral imagination than than doing that. But Salanter was known for doing things like that. One of his former students invited him to come to a Shabbat meal. And the student was very proud, uh, you know, of the fact he says, you'll see Reb Yisrael uh, that at our Shabbos table, you'll be there with my wife and children, but we're going to study Torah at the Shabbos ta table. We're going to sing Zemirot. We're going to sing the traditional Jewish songs. And he was so anxious for Salanter to come that Rabbi Salanter assented. He said, of course I'll, I'll come, but I'm setting two conditions. There can be no study of Torah at the table and no singing of songs. The student was shocked, but he wanted Rabbi Salanter there. And so he agreed. So Salanter comes to the house and uh, sure enough, you know, the meal begins as all meals do. It starts with the Kiddush the washing of the hands, the eating of challah. And then the, the woman, you know, the cook who, who they employed, you know, was serving one meal after uh, one course after another. And the meal concluded very quickly. The student finally got up the nerve to say to Rabbi Salanter at the end of the meal, what did you find wrong with the way we normally do it? I, I was very proud of it. I thought you would like it. He said, let me call out the cook. So the cook comes, an older Jewish woman, and Rabbi Salanter says to her, I, I have to apologize to you. So the cook says, what are you apologizing for? He says, because I put you under such great pressure to have to bring out one course after another. The woman says, thank you, Rabbi. This is the first Friday evening in months that I'm going to be able to get home before midnight every week. You know, obviously, there's a very, very long meal served here. And Rabbi Salanter, after the woman left, she left the house so she could go home. Salanter said, okay, now let's study Torah. Now let's sing. Again, the moral imagination to think of it. Salanter was known that when he would wash his hands, you know, before eating bread, if he knew that this was a house where a maid or, or even the householder or the householder's wife had to carry up water in buckets from a well, he would use the minimum amount of water. 
but you have to think, you have to keep thinking in moral terms to come, uh, to come out like that. Moral imagination sometimes also requires courage. Let me just say, I have no idea what time it is. Okay, how long have I been speaking? You're doing great. No, I know, I know, but about how much longer should I have? Oh, 10 minutes. Okay, good. Okay. Um, just to be clear, you're, you haven't spoke longer than me yet, so just keep going. <laughs> no, you were actually, you were very politely following, uh, following it. You know, Maurice Samuel, uh, Maurice Samuel was a, was a real Jewish scholar of the last, in the 30s, wrote a lot of popular books. Uh, he was once speaking somewhere where there was a rabbi, Rum, who gave a very long introduction Oh God, you know, there's always a danger when you spontaneously think of a story, but then you start getting the details wrong. But what, what do they say that King Nero fiddled while Rome burned? So eh, I'm screwing up the story. I'm not going to tell it. Uh, okay, but anyway, you did not speak a long time. Thank you. And everything you said was actually interesting. And I have now this wonderful image of your dad in my head sitting there like that. And and what an incredible role model it served for his children. Nice model of a father. Okay, sometimes moral imagination requires courage and quick thinking. And I'll give you an example. Larry Kushner tells in one of his books a story of a student he had named Shifra Penzias. Shifra Penzias told him this incredible story about her great aunt, who had unfortunately not left Germany in time in the 30s, I don't know if she eventually got out, but this story is set probably around 35 or 1935 or 36. The Nazis had already taken away citizenship from the Jews. It was dangerous uh, to be a Jew. And her aunt or great aunt was on a bus in Germany in Munich. And suddenly two SS officers got on the bus and they started examining papers. And if the papers that you showed them indicated that you were a Jew, you were told to get off the bus and to go to a truck, which they could see from the bus on the side. Nobody knew, obviously, what would happen. She was sitting near the back of the bus, so they weren't yet near her. And the German man who was sitting next to her saw that suddenly tears were starting to fall down her cheeks. So he said to her, why are you crying? hadn't even occurred to him. She said, I'm not like you. I'm Jewish. I don't have the papers you have. The man immediately exploded in rage at her. He says, you stupid fool. What's the matter with you? The Nazi officers immediately rushed over and said, what's going on here? And he said, my wife, I can't stand it anymore. She always forgets her papers at home. The officers laughed and walked away. The woman never even knew the name of the man. That's an example where you see, obviously, this man had courage. That was a very gutsy thing to do because it didn't have to end so happily. But in addition to that, it also shows, again, the intelligence to be able to think so quickly. That's another example. I have one section of the book, I want to call it accurate or apocryphal, stories that still have much to teach us. Like one is a great story I came across about Gandhi. Again, a lot of stories circulate. You don't know if they're really accurate. They then sometimes get attached to somebody who you could imagine saying something like that. Anyway, so Gandhi in the 1920s is in India and he's a little late for his train. And the train is starting to move out of a train station very, very slowly. So slowly that Gandhi realizes that if he runs after the train, he could still maybe get on it. So he really starts running. People recognize him. And uh, as he nears the train, they pull him up so he can get onto the train. While he's being pulled up, one of his sandals falls off. He gets onto the train, he immediately stands up, he immediately takes off the other sandal and throws it in the direction of the first as far as he can. And people said, why are you doing that? He said, what good is it gonna do the person who finds only one sandal? 
again, again and again, the issue always becomes the speed with which you can think something through. One of the great uh, figures in Polish Jewish life was Akiva Eger, whose, whose works on the Talmud are still actually studied in Yeshivot. But there's a story told often about Akiva Eger. I tend to assume the story must be true because it's told so often and he's sort of, you know, the hero of it. Uh, and it, it's not quite as dynamic as the story that Schiffer Penzi has told about her aunt, where a man basically risked his life with his speed of mind and saved her life. This is a little less dramatic. But anyway, Akiva Eger had guests at his house. The uh, table was set for a beautiful Shabbat meal. And the man accidentally nudges the table and his wine cup spills. And you know what a stain a wine, I mean, we in our house generally keep plastic over the nice tablecloth, but in those days, certainly people weren't doing it. And so it, of course, stained the tablecloth. Within seconds, Akiva Eger nudged his cup. He nudged the table so that his cup spilled. And then he immediately just explained, there's something obviously wrong now with the table, with the balancing of the table. We'll have to take care of it after Shabbat. But again, the speed of which the thing, because could you imagine if you're at a very prominent person's house, you'll be very self-conscious if you suddenly break an item or one of your children breaks an item or you stain the tablecloth, just the speed with which he came up with something. I'll give you another interesting example of moral imagination. A number of years ago, I wrote a book uh, a biography of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. I'm very conscious of it because yesterday was the Rebbe's uh, yard site. Uh, it was his 27th uh, yard site. But one of the stories I tell in the book is actually not about the Rebbe. It's about his wife. And uh, after World War II, an organization was formed called Brecha. Brecha was an organization that helped Jews escape Eastern Europe. Because remember, after the war is as when Winston Churchill, I think he's the one who coined the term, it might have been others, but he's generally credited with coining, coining the term an Iron Curtain. He says an Iron Curtain has fallen over Russia and over much of Eastern Europe. And this organization was helping Jews to escape. The people who were active in Brecha were overwhelmingly not ritually observant Jews. They were basically secular Jewish Zionists, very committed Zionists, but they were of a secular orientation. The Rebetzin, Chaya Mushka Schneerson, she was not yet the Rebetzin, she used to refer to these people as tzaddikim without tefillin. Now, I'm assuming most of you know what tefillin are. If you don't know what tefillin are, they're phylacteries. Now you know. Now, I'm actually joking. There's nobody in the world who puts on tefillin who says, oh, yeah, I put on my phylacteries this morning. The only thing you know is that if somebody uses the word phylacteries, they don't put them on. But obviously, that's a very, you know, basic mitzvah. It certainly is still, is certainly binding in conservative among conservative and Orthodox Jews. And particularly, it's a known fact that Chabad has always placed extraordinary emphasis on this particular mitzvah, you know, stopping men in the street. Are you Jewish? If you're Jewish, have you put on tefillin? If you're women, do you light Shabbat candles? And the term tzaddik, when used in the Jewish world, while it refers to a person of high ethical sensitivity, it usually also means somebody who's also very ritually observant. The thought of calling somebody who doesn't put on tefillin a tzaddik is sort of inconceivable, but it just showed, no, she was elevating ethics back to where they were supposed to be. You know, what did Hillel say? People often don't remember correctly the story about Hillel. They think a non-Jew said to Hillel, can you define the essence of Judaism while standing on one foot? And it was in response to that that Hillel said, Da'alecha sani, what's hateful unto you, don't do unto your neighbor. But that wasn't the non-Jew's question. The non-Jew actually said to Hillel, Gayereni almanat, 
convert me to Judaism on the condition that you can teach it to me while I'm standing on one foot. I don't know how modern rabbis want to handle this, modern, you know, very observant rabbis, but I am telling you that is, it was in response to that question that Hillel answered, what's hateful unto you, don't do unto your neighbor. So this again, you know, the thought that she put it like that and called them tzaddikim without tefillin uh, is, you know, is what, is is what's so moving to me. I'm going to conclude with one story that I learned from one of my favorite people in Jewish life, who is a man who died within the last months and who did die of COVID. He was 90 and he had led an extraordinary life, Abraham Tversky. He was a man I loved very, very, very deeply. Anyway, there are two wonderful stories I want to tell you about Tversky. I hope this won't take me beyond the 10 minutes, but it'll, 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 it'll get us near there. One is that Tversky was ordained at a very young age. He was ordained, I think he was like 18 or 19. He was obviously a bit of a wunderkind. And he was the assistant to his father at a Hasidic shul in Milwaukee, where he grew up. Tversky was one of five sons. The sons, he had no sisters, and uh, they went throughout, they ended up living in different parts of the United States and also Israel. Tversky decided when he was in his early 20s that he wanted to study medicine. He felt that in the next generation, the sort of Jews who went to a Rebbe to get advice would probably end up not going to a Rebbe, but going to a psychiatrist. So he wanted to go to medical school and study psychiatry. He starts doing it. He was already married uh, and his father would lend him money and he had a little money and his father would borrow money or get donations from members of the congregation. But at a certain point in the late fifties, when he still had, I think another year and a half or so of medical school, uh, he, owed, he was gonna need $4,000, which today sounds to us like a laughable sum to finish a year and a half of medical school. But in those days, if you translate it with the rates of inflation, it was more like the equivalent of fifty or $60,000. Anyway, one day he calls his wife in the middle of the day and she says, you have the money. He says, what are you talking about? She said, there was a little article in a Chicago newspaper that the actor Danny Thomas uh, said, uh, I'm going to give the $4,000. It was Marquette University that he was attending and Danny Thomas was on their board and he heard that there was a rabbi, you know, who needed, who was short this money, he said, tell the rabbi he has. It. A few days later, Tversky calls up Danny Thomas to thank him. By the way, when it happened, he didn't even know who Danny Thomas was. He didn't have a television. Danny Thomas was, of course, for those of us who were like my age and others, was, you know, one of the best known comic actors in America. Uh, Anyway, so Thomas, when he answers the phone, says to him, I just want you to know I'm very upset that that article appeared in the Chicago newspaper. Probably somebody from the university probably, you know, wanted it publicized because it was such a nice piece. He said, I want, this is something I really wanted to do anonymously. And you and I know that a lot of people think that anonymous charitable donations are the best. But the truth is sometimes an anonymity isn't the best. So anyway, a few years later, Tversky finally has a chance to be in L.A. and he goes to meet with Danny Thomas. And again, Thomas says to him, I really didn't want that publicized. And Tversky says to him, do you think, he said, every day the newspapers are filled with so much bad news. Do you really think it's such a terrible thing if one day there's an article in the newspaper how a Lebanese Catholic helped the Hasidic Jew finish medical school? One other story Tversky tells, which can maybe help console some people who are now listening uh, of some of your concerns. Not all, believe me, I know that, not all. Tversky had a brother who was very, very sick, who ended up dying, unfortunately, at, a, at an early age. And when his brother was very sick, he did what many religious Jews do, what even many not so religious Jews do, he went to a rabbi he regarded on a, on a very high level, and he asked him to make a bracha for his 
brother's healing. And of course, the rabbi gave him a bracha, you know, the Misha Berach prayer that somebody who's sick should uh, get well. When he left, Tversky asked him for a bracha, a blessing. And the blessing he gave Tversky was, may you have many worries. Tversky, of course, was very puzzled. What sort of bracha is that? He says, because when somebody comes to me and they only have one worry, it's something truly terrible going on. He says, all you can think now is your father. He said, from now on, though, if you have a lot of worries, it means no, not one of, there's no one of them that is so terrible. Torsky said, oddly enough, that has given him some consolation. He said, when a person has only one worry, it's bad. It means that there is something so terribly distressing bothering him that he can't think of anything else. If one has many worries, that means that there is nothing so overwhelmingly bad that it obscures everything else. It is not realistic to imagine you're ever going to be without any worry. The best situation is to have many small worries. That means that there is no one terribly disturbing thing going on, going on in your life. He said it at least enabled me ever since then, when I have minor annoyances, I'm running late for an appointment, you know, and suddenly it seems so terrible. My, my mother was a worrier. My mother you know, later on, she expressed her embarrassment. She told me that her first day at college, and my mother, this would have been like in 1928, uh, when she started college, her first day at college, she was running late. You know, she was going by train. She lived in Borough Park. They were, she was going to NYU. And my mother told me this with embarrassment. She said, I said to God, if you can only get me to class today on time, I'll never ask anything again of you. Obviously, she felt like a fool, but that's it. You know, people sometimes, and I have that nature, I can overly worry about things. So may you be blessed with many small worries and many wonderful blessings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Uh Do you have time for just a few quick questions? Certainly. Okay. I have as much time as you guys. Yeah, well, you know, I have to let people go. They are, the, the California people have to hit, have to have some lunch and by the pool, as I mentioned earlier. So uh, first question. So how, how did you collect your anecdote? Have you, first of all, have you, have you collected all your anecdotes now for the book? Are you still collecting them? The I am still collecting them. I am making an appeal. Okay. jtolushkin at AOL.com. If you have any great stories, send them. I will make sure if I use them, if I use what, you, what somebody sends me, I will credit you in the book. If you send me one and I already have it, you know, I can't promise I'm going to credit 12 different people. But if you have a great story that really illustrates moral imagination, yes. How did I collect them? Uh, I write in my books. A lot of people don't. My sister, who, uh, who for 35 years was a librarian, is horrified that I write in my books. But that's the reason why I buy so many books, because I want to have the right to write in them. And then I'm giving this advice to anybody to whom it can be helpful. I don't only mark them up. But on the front page of the book, you know, which is usually blank when you open up a book, I write down the page numbers and a brief summary of what was so striking to me. So that makes life a little easier for me because I can go through and I have, relatively speaking, a large library. So I can go through a lot of books. And I also fortunately have a good memory for stories. So when I hear a story, I usually can remember it, but then of course I also research it. Well, if it's a personal story, like my friend who summoned his children and and uh, told them, if your mother falls in love again, I want to marry. He actually told it to me during the last weeks of his life. Uh, but if it's a, if, if it deals like with an historical figure, you know, so then I'll research it to make sure I can authenticate it. So that's generally where it comes from, but I'm open to getting stories. Okay, good. So CSP people, please send stories so we can have a, if we send enough stories, we have to mention CSP in this book. That's, that's a okay, deal we have. Yes. Okay, okay. So when you send it to Rabbi Chalishkin, just say CSP person. Um, do you feel that we were heading in, in a downward spiral when it comes to morality? Are we just stagnating? I mean, you read the news and it seems like we're going downward. And if so, I mean, obviously this book is needed, but is it really needed right now because of what's going on? Or do you feel that Humanity is just going on as humanity goes on. 
look, I think humanity goes on as humanity goes on, because I know every generation, you know, I'm aware as anybody is that every generation, you know, thinks the world is in decline. I can't imagine that people more thought the world was in decline than in 1945 when the Holocaust ended, uh, you know, and things changed. So I think there are many things here that will be repercussive uh, to people. It's always going to be a problem in sensitivities of the sort that I talked about. But I want to say something else. I'm open to learning from people who I have many areas of disagreement with. And one of them who's a person I have some disagreements with is the New York Times uh, correspondent, Thomas Friedman. But I'm going to quote something that Friedman wrote some years ago, which I think is brilliant. He said, pessimists are more often right than optimists. And optimists are more often wrong than pessimists. But only optimists can achieve anything. I think that's what has to. I know Jews right now. Am I discouraged? Oh my God, am I discouraged with, I think, the unfair roasting and treatment of Israel uh, over what happened now in Gaza? I know a woman, you know, people are talking about the children who were killed, which is a terrible tragedy, but you got to go also to the source of it. Uh, you know, and there was this episode now where quite a number of rabbinical students at, uh, at a number of different seminaries wrote a letter condemning Israel's behavior using the word apartheid, which is like a lightning rod. Anytime you start talking about Israel and apartheid, you're basically trying to rouse all of African Americans against Israel. So it's a lightning rod word. So to put that word in their letter, because in addition to it being, of course, not true, that alone should stop presumably rabbinical students from signing such a letter. And I don't want to exaggerate the numbers, but it was not an insignificant number. It was over 90. And then, of course, they don't mention Hamas in the letter because the man who seems to have played a big role behind the letter, I won't mention his name, I don't know enough about him, uh, you know, basically said, well, I don't know how I would feel if I was an Arab who had lived for so long under such Israeli oppression, so how can I condemn Hamas? Oi, 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 oi. So, uh, but we got to do something. So we have to take on these things. Because as I said, one thing I know, if we don't actively try and combat the lies about Israel, it'll definitely, things will definitely get worse. Can I be sure in acting in a more optimistic plane, if we put out truth and enough truth, can I be sure things will improve? I can't, but I know on one side, definitely it'll get worse. And on the other side, there, you know, there is room for improvement. This is very unfair, but we don't know when things will happen. Look, a year ago, Israel suddenly was establishing relations with a whole bunch, uh, with several, you know, Muslim countries. And uh, nobody would have predicted that what happened now uh, would happen. So um, in our last minutes, you, you read a lot. You've mentioned that. You've written you've written uh, police detective novels. Now I, I know you mentioned that on a uh, recent project you and I worked on for Rabbi Ellie Spitz. I'll look those up. But is there anything you're reading now that you are finding some are you, that you would suggest to all of us to read? Is there a book? Yeah, that it's you... not a recent book. It's a book that was written I don't know probably about fifteen or twenty years ago. Uh, actually, it'll take us back in the direction uh, that you were uh, that you were speaking. Okay, I'm going to mention two books. Uh, the one that I think is a very important book was written by a philosopher named Jonathan Glover, G-L-O-V-E-R. It's called Humanity, a Moral History. And it is a view, it is a history of the, of the last century. Glover is what I would call sort of a tragic atheist. He philosophically does not believe in God but he also recognizes that without God, morality seems to have faced a terrible downward spiral. Probably the most famous atheist writer of the 20th century was Bertrand Russell. And Russell also encountered that problem, which he never adequately answered. He said, 
I cannot see how to refute the argument for the subjectivity of all ethical values, but I refuse to accept that the only thing wrong with wanton cruelty is that I don't like it. But he never was able to come back, you know, with a more definitive answer than that. Also, on the other hand, there's another book that I read recently, uh, which uh, I can't remember the name of the book. So if anybody types it into you, maybe they'll remember. Uh, I suffered a very, very tragic loss this year. The youngest of my four children, my son Benjamin, uh, died in his 20s. And obviously, I've been saying Kaddish, you know, throughout the year. Anyway, uh, one day at my shul, I met a man who, who I didn't know, uh, who, who I knew of, but I didn't know him. The rabbi, I go to the Karlbach shul in the Upper West Side, one of the shuls I go, Ramat Ora. Anyway, uh, the rabbi introduced me to another man in shul who was Elisha Wiesel. And, uh, and he was there, I said, who are you saying Kaddish for? He said, you can tell how recently this happened. It was the second of Sivan. So it means it was just before Shavuot. And he said, I'm saying it for my grandfather and grandmother and my great aunt, because I know they were all taken to Auschwitz uh, on the second of Sivan. Anyway, we ended up spending quite a bit of time talking. And he told me about the Elie Wiesel Foundation Humanitarian Award. And he'd given it that year to two men one whose last name was Black and one whose last name was Stevenson. They had met in college. Black, it turned out, is the son, and this is not that long ago, he's probably in his early 30s now, is the son of a former head of the Ku Klux Klan in the United States. Black's godfather is David Duke, who was, of course, the biggest pro, you know, Nazi defender and other things. When he went to this college, he still had very terrible white supremacist views, but he was trying to keep his identity somewhat hidden, even though he often would speak with his father on the radio about his views. Anyway, one of the school newspapers found out who he was and publicized it. We have a student among us whose father is the head of the Ku was the head of the Ku Klux Klan, who created, uh, I forgot what their website is, Stormfront or something, some horrible website. So obviously, immediately, he became like totally boycotted by everybody. Uh, but this young man, Stevenson, who himself was a convert to Judaism, was the only Jew on campus who wore a yarmulke. And he reached out to Black and he invited him to come to a Shabbat dinner. They had known each other pre previously. He didn't know who Black's background was. And he started coming to Shabbat dinners and people were not talking politics to him. And eventually he was transformed. This was an act of moral imagination. One, I don't know if I would have done. I, you know, I don't say I would have acted like that. Uh, but anyway, so Alicia dropped off this book for me. And I feel stupid now because I can't remember the title of the book. But I found that I couldn't put it down. So they offer, you know, it was a story of redemption at a time of pessimism. And that's why I was happy that I had the chance to read it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing your personal stories, the stories about your book. Uh, when we thought about doing this honor a uh, Maimonides Award for Excellence in Jew Jewish Education, we wanted to do a program that featured what we do best, which is to have a great teacher teach in celebration. And um, we appreciate you taking, accepting the honor to be our teacher today. We appreciate Rabbi Savinor for everything he's done in teaching. We look forward to uh, reading your next book, Rabbi Chalishkin, and many more. I will look up your detective stories and buy one. So we'll get a little notch up on Amazon there for you. If it's there, I don't know where it is. I want to thank our audience. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, after this program, I will share a recording for those of you who um, missed it or wanted to hear it again, as well as um, some follow-up information that we talked about today. I know, I, I know the book you're talking about. I, I mean, I've heard about the book um, uh, and I will, um, will send it to people. I know, I know about the authors because we heard about the story from Ariel Berger. One, one slight thing I wanted to mention was one of our first speakers at CSP over, almost 20 years ago, 
friend, Gus, and remind me, it was Rabbi Tversky. Um, and we had him here. Um, we've had many great speakers. In fact, we've, I think we've hosted you once or twice live here in Orange County as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, yeah. We, uh, we look forward to the day we can have you here live in Orange County, but we really appreciate having you online. And uh, again, uh, Mazel Tov to Rabbi Charlie Savinor and the whole Savinor family. And thank you all for being with us today. Um, a, yeah. real, a real Why pleasure. Yashikayach to you, Rabbi Savinor. Yashikayach. A real uh, an honor and a pleasure to have Rabbi Telushkin with us. We hope to have you back. Um, thank you and very much. and uh, CSP World, thank you for everything you do. Thank you for supporting CSP. I'll email you about how if you want to participate in uh, the Joseph Savinor uh, Fund um, for the annual endowment. I'll email you later if that's of interest to you, and it's much much appreciated. Have a great day. See you all this week. Lots of CSP coming up. Um, go to occsp.net to to the to um, Linda Savinor. You have a great son. He's done great things. You can be proud of him. Okay, you can cry now if you haven't been crying the whole time. Thank you, everybody. Have a have a great day. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye bye.